um, we've been looking at guarding your heart for the last few weeks, haven't we? Guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life or the streams of life. Now, I want to talk to you today and I want to continue. And today I want to talk about guilt. Yes? Who knows that word guilt? Guilty feeling. And all of us has got a guilty conscience and feeling. We were born that way. If you were born and if you're sitting here today, you are after Adam. You know, Adam and Eve who stood in the Garden of Eden. <clears throat> and that sin puts a strain on you and it starts with guilt. So I want to talk today about not festering guilt in your heart. Because if it festers in your heart, it will have an effect on you. And we're going to open this up now. The definition for guilt is a feeling of worry. Now we addressed worry last week, didn't we? It's a feeling of worry or unhappiness. Unhappiness. That you, have, that you have because you have done something wrong, such as causing harm to another person. That's what you find when you open up in the dictionary. That is guilt. You've done something wrong. And you've got this terrible unhappiness, which controls your life sometimes. It takes everything over. It takes over your thoughts. It occupies you 24 seven. Every single time you go there and you know sometimes it's something that happened in your past. It could have been something what you've done when you were younger and then all of a sudden those thoughts comes up. Is it only happening to me? Is it you as well? And then sometimes you still get that strong feeling of guilt. <clears throat> this is what the definition say. It's a worry. It's an un unhappiness. Somebody said it like this. They said guilt is like the red warning light on your dashboard of your car. You either stop and deal with it, or you put a tape over it. <laughs> I mean, some people do that, you know. The petrol light comes up. It's a red light normally. Now, what do you do when the petrol light comes up? You go to the petrol station, isn't it? Because you need to fill it up. Now, if you take a sticky tape and you put it over it, is, is that going to solve the problem? And this is the same with guilt. This is what this person says. He says that... You know, guilt is like that, that light that comes up. And like I say, everybody's got guilt. It is what we do with that guilt that matters. And this is what I want to talk about today. Because I can assure you, brother and sister, while you are sitting here today, and while I am preaching here today, there is an accuser every single moment going to the Father accusing you. He accuses you. Why? Because he's not inside your life anymore. When you are a blood-washed child of God, when you are saved by the grace of God, what happens? He comes in. The Holy Spirit comes in and makes habitation within you. He comes and He lives inside of you. This is what the Bible says. Now, Satan, the son, the spirit of the sons of disobedience is no longer in you. Who's in you? The Holy Spirit. And because He's not, no longer in you, He's standing right here outside your ear, as my brother said today. He's shouting in with a megaphone into your head all of those things you've done. And he says to you, you are a hypocrite. You're walking here in church. You say beautiful hallelujahs. You, you hug the brothers. You hug the sisters. But he's standing there with his megaphone and he says, yeah, you see, you're a hypocrite. What have you done last week? And he keeps on coming to you in that way. Because there's something that guilt does to you. You see, guilt is a legal term. You find guilt or not guilty. And where do you find this? In a court of law. That's where you find these words. It's a legal term. Now when we cross a moral or an ethical or a legal line, we are guilty. And, and like I said before, we were all born sinners. I've met a man once and he said, no, no, all babies are born perfect when they come out of the womb. And it's the parents who teach us children to sin. I said to him, that's very strange because you've got small little children. Now you bring them up, you show them all the right things, you keep them away from TV and you tell them not to say the naughty words and everything is fine because you're a Christian. How is it then? How is it then that when you go to the supermarket that that little angel of you that's two years old fall on the ground and start shouting and kicking their feet? Where is that coming from? From mom and dad? 
Have they seen it from you? No, they haven't. What is inside of him? It is that resistance. And this is inside of all of us. Is the resistance against God's laws. I mean, there's a lot of road rules here outside. And how many times have you gone over the speed limit? You see, it's a legal term. If the police catches you, what's going to happen? He's going to give you a fine. He's going to bring judgment upon you. So this is what it is. Now there's two ways of guilt. One is an objective guilt. An objective guilt. And this is on the outward. When you see this guilt, it is normally a legal guilt. You violated some society laws. That's legal. That's what I said about the road signs. <clears throat> if you go and, and this road here is 80 kilometers an hour, and I've heard some young men in this church has got very good and forceful cars. If they go down there, they can only go as fast as 80 kilometers an hour. And I come with my little caddy, and I catch up with them because I can only go to 80. It's the moment we go over that limit that we are pulled over and we are charged. So that's a legal thing. It's something that happens on the outside. But another objective guilt is theological guilt. And that is the failure to obey God. That's theological. That is coming back to the Bible. And then there's also personal guilt. Personal guilt is when you violate your own personal standards. Do you know what I'm talking about? Those times that you say, I'm not going to do it, then you do it. Is it you or is it only me? Or sometimes you just say something, you say, why did I say that? And sometimes you say something that you don't mean. Is that you? And what happens after you've said it? You feel so guilty. Because there is immediately a guilt conscience that comes upon you. If you're a child of God. Because there's sometimes people who don't even listen to that guilt side of things. But then you also find a social guilt. And this is to violate social rules. You know, like walking into a library and you talk out loud. Where there's a social agreement that we want to read books here. And you just go in there and you, you're rude. Rudeness is one of those. Rudeness is one of those. If you're a person who's really rude to people, you know, there's no law that they say that they're going to put you in a jail for this, but it's just rude. It is a social guilt. And immediately you start feeling this coming upon your life. So these are objective. You can see it. It's like an object. But then also guilt. And I want to talk to you today about these two. I mean, you can sort out with your lawyer the legal guilt, okay? I'm not a lawyer. I'm a, I'm a pastor. I'm a preacher. <clears throat> but I want to talk to you about theological guilt and personal guilt. Because these two are the ones that holds a lot of Christians back. These two. It's a guilty conscience that holds back. And then the second one is a subjective guilt. This is more inward. This is when you, fall, if you, when you feel remorse. When you feel ashamed about something. And it also comes down to self-condemnation. So you get an objective... And then you get the subject of guilt. And I want to unpack those for you today. So first of all, let's look at the theological guilt or the personal guilt. And we open up in your Bibles in Psalm 32. Now here in Psalm 32 we find David. And I love to read David in his Psalms. He gives out to each and every one of us his open life. He's like an open book when you open up in Psalms. <clears throat> but Psalm 32 specifically... And I implore you to go this afternoon and to go and read this psalm, to unpack it. Listen to him. Listen to him when he, when he gives and he talks to us about this guilt that grabbed a hold of him and what he did. In Psalm 32 verse 1, he says, a psalm of David is a contemplation. It means that you need to sit and you need to think about these things. Don't just rush over them. Read it. Think about it. This is what this word means here, selah. Selah means pause, contemplate, think, and then apply it to your life. So that, as Sean said, that we can bear much fruit. Do you know that guilt holds back your fruit? It holds it back. It holds back your progress in life. It holds, not only in the church, but also in your life out there. It holds back your relationships with your family members, with friends. Guilt can break up relationships. I've seen it with my own eyes. 
But listen to what David says. He said, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven. Are you feeling blessed this morning? He says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Now you must understand that David was writing in the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, those are the words that they've used. Because the blood of animals covered their sins. It is like this is him. This is David. And it's like an open book for God. This is you today. You're an open book for God. You can hide stuff from people. You can walk into the church and hide it with a smile. But before God, you will always be an open book. There's no secrets that you can hide from God. You can go into your inner room, close the door, nobody sees you. And you can do things which will give you a guilty conscience. And you think nobody sees you, but God will see you. You can't hide from Him. The Bible says you can go as high as you want to. You can go down on the earth. You can go east, west, south, west, wherever. God will find you there. Even now, He finds your mind. He knows what you are thinking right now. So here it is, in the Old Testament, they had such a guilt that they had to take an animal. And here is the open book. Here is David for God, and God sees into his heart. Yes, that, that womanizing that you did, David. Those sins, that selfishness. And you know what he said? This animal's blood is now going to cover. It's going to cover those so that when God looks, he can't see the sin of David anymore, but he sees the blood, the atoning blood of an animal. Where there is sin, there must be a remission of sin by blood. That is the message of the Bible. There has to be a price that's been paid. And you know what, brothers and sisters, even as we sit here today, as I'm standing here today, there was a huge price that was paid for you and for me. That's the blood of Jesus Christ. And here is the great news, the great and fantastic news that you should shout hallelujah for the rest of your life, that it doesn't cover it anymore, it washes it away. Hallelujah. Amen. How wonderful is that to sit here this morning. These men, David, Moses, Aaron, you name them, all of those men had to sit with that guilt on their shoulders. It couldn't be washed away. All they had to do is to go to that animal and they had to be covered by that blood. But here you are sitting. Here I'm standing before you. No weight of sin on your shoulders anymore. And if you do have that weight on your shoulder this morning, come to the cross. Quickly, run to the cross, because there's still room for you there. Oh, but I'm going to church. You see me here. That doesn't matter. You have to come to the cross. He ha he's got to wash away all of your sin, like it says there in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. He says now, whose sin is covered. Verse 2, he said, blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. And that's a fantastic blessing. You know, when Jesus Christ went there in the garden of Gethsemane, and he took that cup, what is that cup called? The cup of joy. Is it the cup of joy? Is it the cup of laughter? No, no, what is it? It is the cup of wrath of God. That is what it is. Now let me tell you, brother and sister, if you do not allow Christ to drink that cup on your behalf, you will drink that cup yourself. You will drink it. But He's done it already for you. And all you need to do is to run to the cross. That's all you need to do. He says, The Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent, now listen to these words. When I kept silent, that means when I did not confess. That means when I did not come to God. That means when I tried to hide these sins and I lived my secret life. What happened? He said, my bones grew old. Can you feel it in his body? He feels like an old man. Now I can tell you, I'm still a young man, but I've got a few pains in my body. I had this week a terrible pain as a young man. But the older you get, they say, and there's a few older people than me in the room, the older you get, you start feeling the aches and pains more. Isn't that right? <clears throat> Here is a young man, and he says, I'm feeling like an old man. And what's bringing that upon him? Sin. Sin and the guilt stain that comes upon him. He says, my bones grew old. 
through my groaning all day long. He's groaning, continuing on. He says, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My brother and sister, you do not want the hand of God heavy upon you. You rather would want the hand of God to lift you up, wouldn't you? And he says in Isaiah, he says Isaiah chapter 59 verse 1, he says, my arm is not short to help you. His hand is there for you. You go right through into the book of Acts. And he says that the hand of God was with them. You want the hand of God with you, not upon you to push you down. What is pushing you down? It's that guilt stain. We're talking about guarding your heart with all diligence against the guilt that festers inside of you. Look at this now. He says, He was heavy upon me. My vitality, my vitality was turned into the drought of summer. The drought of summer. He says there's no rain. I'm feeling dry. Vitality means there is freshness. Vitality means there is, there is moist. There is, there is goodness in there. But you don't find this in a desert, do you? You don't find vitality in a desert. So this is what he writes. He says, I've, I've got a guilt problem. I had a guilt problem. And he took that guilt problem to one place. It is the cross. You will hear right through today's message the answer for your guilt. There's only one answer, and His name is Jesus Christ. Listen to me. If you are young here this morning, listen to me very carefully. Get rid of sin before sin gets rid of you. Do that. Come to the cross, and that will happen at the cross. You see, but, but Saul or Paul had the same issues, didn't he? He had the same issue. I gave you an Old Testament man, David. Let's go to a New Testament man who wrote most of your Bible. The man of God who wrote, who was, who was changed at the road of Damascus. He writes in Romans chapter 7 verse 18. He says, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. I go, wait a minute, this is Paul. We're talking about the Apostle Paul here. And this is after the road of Damascus. Have you noticed? This is after he was saved. And this is why I say so often in this church, I'm not preaching to you sinless perfection. This is what Paul is teaching us today. He says, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, there's nothing good dwells for to, to, to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. So often that describes me. I'm not going to stand here and be a hypocrite before you. That sometimes, I feel like Paul sometimes, and here he writes it, in the present tense. Have you noticed? It's in the present tense. You see, he had the same issue. He says in verse 19, For the good that I will do, I do not do. I want to do good. But the evil I will not do, those I practice. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin that dwells in me. You see, because he don't want to do it. But sin dwells inside of him, in the present and it becomes an attack against him. Verse 21, he says, I find then a law. He found a law. What law is it then, Paul? That evil is present with me. He says, evil is going around. It's present with me. The one who wills to do. I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. Is that you this morning? Oh man, I want to worship and praise God in my inward man until the day I die. He says, this is what I want to do. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind. My mind says, don't do it, but my body says he wants to do it. It gets the cravings and you give in to the cravings. It gets the temptations and you give in to the temptations. And then he says, listen to this now. Listen, you need to concentrate. He says, and bringing, everybody say bringing me into, everybody say captivity, to the law of sin which is in my members. He says there's something that captivates you. There is something that holds you back. 
You want to grow. You look at other brothers and sisters in the church who grow fast in the faith. And you can't grow as fast as them. Why, Lord? What's happening here? You need to search your heart. Because, you know, he says, guard your heart. Look inside. What is festering there? And one of these things that he's addressing here is the guilt of sin. The guilt of sin. Now look at this verse. He says, O wretched man that I am. Let me ask you the question this morning. What tense is that? Present tense. O wretched man that I am today. I'm a wretched man. Who will deliver me from this body of death? And then he gives the answer. The Bible has got always the accusation. The Bible puts to you the problem, the issue. But the Bible always gives you the answer. Praise the Lord. Amen. He says, I thank God. I thank God. Who will deliver me? Who will deliver me? I thank God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus Christ the Messiah. The Anointed One. This is a title. So then... So then, I love it when Paul, Paul always writes this down. He says, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but the flesh, the law of sin. Now, brothers and sisters, the seat for guilt is in your conscience. That's where guilt sits, in your conscience. It's got a nice, comfy sofa there. And he comes in, and he sits down in the sofa. In your mind. And he kicks his feet up on your coffee table. And he puts his hand behind his back. And he settles in. That is guilt. He sits in your conscience. And you know he's so comfortable there. That every time if you want to go forward. You want to take the next step. Mm -hmm. He flicks his finger and says bring me another coffee. I'm comfortable here. That's guilt. It festers. And it's affecting you. I'm going to show you how it affects you. It occupies your whole life sometimes. Not sometimes. I would say most of the times. I want to concentrate now again on Paul. They bring him in front of this whole council. And they, it, it's his final court case. You know, they're going to find him guilty or not. And he says these words which is so profound for me today. Because you see, when guilt was sitting there on that nice couch of, of, of Paul's life. He took care of guilt. He says, no, 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 no. I need to vacuum this place. Either you get out or I vacuum you the same way. Yes. Now guilt needs to go. Guilt needs to go. He says in Acts chapter 24 verse 16. He says, this being so. And he's talking to you. I'm parachuting into this chapter. But you need to go and read it in context. But I want to use this phrase that he uses here so beautifully. He says, this being so, I myself always strive. Everybody say strive. You see that word there in English? You know, I love the Greek words. He says, I strive to have a conscience without offense towards God and men. Is that what you're striving for? <clears throat> I told you before, this guilt finds it's a comfortable place in your conscience. And Paul understood this. He said, I strive. The word strive there comes from the Greek word askio. It means I exercise. It's an exercise that you do. It's not something that's just going to happen. You know, some people come to church, they are safe, and they just sit back and say, okay, Lord, do your work. It's just going to happen. No, no, there's some work that you need to do. This is what Sean was talking about that night on, on when I did that message at the home service. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, he says, Work out your own salvation. You need to work on your salvation. It's not work to be saved. It is now that you are saved, work to bring it to completion. It doesn't mean that your salvation is not complete. If you die when you're saved, you go to heaven. That is, that is complete. He's, Christ did a perfect work in saving you. But now you need to work out and you need to grow. You need to grow. And this is where it comes. All of these words. All of these words. Exercise. It was also... The word labor. What does labor mean? Labor means it's an effort. Have you labored in your life? If you take the, you know, you, the gravel and you need to work the gravel away, you're laboring. It, it draws strength from you. 
But you know what you do when you do that work over and over again? You become stronger, isn't it? Your muscles become muscle memory. And, and if you do the same thing and you keep on exercising against these things, you will grow stronger in it. And the Holy Spirit's always there to help you. The Holy Spirit is your paracletos. He comes alongside you and assists you. I love it when Paul writes like this. He's, you know, he's not turning and he says, you need to work on it. Because we are so easy, isn't it, to show fingers to other people and to see the mistakes in their lives instead of searching our hearts. He says, I exercise, I labor to have a conscience. You know, we can pray as much as we want to and say, Lord, I don't want to do it, I don't want to do it, but then you do it. It's because you are not laboring not to do it. You have to discipline your mind. You have to discipline your body. You have to be sometimes say no. In fact, if it's the wrong thing morally, you have to always say no. So that's so beautiful when he writes this to them. And then, and then this word conscience here, it, the Greek meaning here is the soul as distinguishing between what is morally good and bad. That's what the Greek word means. So what is Paul saying here to us? He says <clears throat> to that whole council and to us today, he says, I, Paul, this man who wrote so many letters, most of your New Testament, the apostle to the Gentiles, he says he is not too good to work on these things. He says, but I'm working out my own salvation. I work hard on my conscience to get it into a morally good state. It's not works, brothers and sisters. It is what you have to do. Now you remember our little man, and we're going to stay with him maybe another few weeks, but we know that what is in the heart controls the soul. The content of the heart controls the soul, and what is in the soul is the real you. It controls your body. This is how it works. Now if guilt is going to be sitting in the comfortable sofa of conscience in your heart, it's going to control your soul and it's going to keep you back. This is why we need to guard your hearts and your minds. So what is the effect of guilt on people? What effect has guilt got upon you and me? Let's have a look at a few of those. First of all, it gives you a defensive thinking. Isn't it right? We all love this one. Defensive thinking. When I do something wrong, we jump onto the blame game. We blame others for what we have done. Is that only me? It's happened so many times in my life, isn't it? You do something naughty and then you go, well, yeah, but they told me to do it. If, if, why did you do it? It was a serpent. No, no, he didn't start with if, he started with Adam. <laughs> yes, I purposely said it the other way around. He says, Adam, hey, I told you not to do that thing. You are guilty. Was Adam guilty? Of course he was. He broke one of the moral laws of God. Disobedience is a sin. Disobedience is a sin as witchcraft. God says to you to do something, you don't do it, it's witchcraft. You say, I will never, never play wishy-washy boards and be a witchcraft. No, no, I will never. Stop then being disobedient. So, so here it is. Hey, Adam, why have you done it? The woman whom you've given me. Now all of a sudden it's God's fault, isn't it? Why did you give me the woman? Well, why did you listen to her? Oh, I'm a, I'm a serious place now. <laughs> we have to listen to our wives <laughs> as well. So then he came to Eve and he says, Hey Eve, wh why? Why? You see, she had the guilt stain upon her now. You see now how the message comes together? And guilt made himself so comfortable in her conscience. And what is the first thing she does? He says, but it was the serpent. And this is what we do. Brothers and sisters, listen to me. If you find yourself so many times that you start blaming others for the things you're doing, it means that guilt is sitting in your conscience. It's made himself comfortable there. And you know what it's going to do? He makes himself comfortable so that you are not comfortable. Because it affects you. You can't do the things you want to do anymore because you're holding back. So the, one of the first effects of guilt is defensive thinking. Blame others. It's easier to show others and stand in the corner and they don't see you. But like I said, God always sees everything. The second thing is self-condemnation. That's an effect of guilt, isn't it? 
I find it so many times when somebody's guilty, instead of coming to the cross and confess their sin, or instead to say, sorry, please forgive me, they go into a self-condemnation thing. Oh, you know, I'm so poor and inadequate, and this is why I'm always... They, they've got this low self-esteem. This is what happens. This is guilt. Brothers and sisters, why am, I te- why am I teaching this? I said to you a few weeks ago, I believe the Lord wants, wants us to see this. Why are you the way you are? Maybe the Lord is talking to you this morning. Get rid of guilt before guilt gets rid of you. And here it is, you know, it is self-condemnation. That's one of the effects of guilt. What, what more? Physical reactions. Did you know? You know, your body takes strain upon it when this guilt sits in your conscience. I just read to you Psalm 32. What does David say? He says, my bones grow old. He says, my vitality is like in the drought of summer. Guilt takes an effect on your body, whether you like it or not. It drains your energy. It pulls you down. You want to wake up in the morning and be... You know, do you know people who want to wake up and say, today I want to be miserable? I just choose to be miserable? You need to go and find out what is the things that makes you miserable. And I I can tell you, most of the times it will be that guy, that fella called guilt, sitting on the sofa of conscience in your mind. Come to this point and ask the Lord to look into this. There's physical reaction and there, there is moral reactions, isn't it? Moral reactions. You come into a place where you feel so guilty and you say, I don't want to go to church anymore because, you know, I'm feeling so exposed. The Spirit of the Lord is so strong. You know why some people do not come to this church? Because the preaching of the Word is too hard for them. It's too hard. And this is where guilt comes in a moral reaction. They want the ears to be trickled and they want to hear all of the nice things and how good you are and best life now. And man, that's all right. You know, it's not sin. It's only a problem you have in your life. No, sin is sin. And and the reason why sin is sin, it needs to be dealt. And the only way that it's going to be dealt with is the blood of Christ. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand here. Amen. But this is what he does. Guilt brings moral reactions. And all of a sudden... All of a sudden, you were with the hypocrites for over two years, and all of a sudden, now they're the hypocrites, and you're the right one, and you leave. Because there's guilt stain sitting somewhere. Now, I'm not saying it's the only one. It could be guilt. There's other factors as well. But can you see the effects? Have you experienced some of these effects? I have, certainly. I have. I told you, I'm going to be open to you. There's no perfect man standing in front of you. I'm just like you. You know, it's not Pastor John is now all of a sudden the superhuman. No, no, no. They, if, if somebody feels like that, they're wrong. But here we find the effects, the effects of a guilty conscience. And brothers and sisters, there's so many verses I can go to right now about the conscience. You can have a sheared conscience. Have you heard about that one? It means that you come to a point where you, you confess, but then you do it again. And you confess and you do it again. And it becomes like a callister. Have you felt, is it the callister? Yeah, yeah. Callous. Uh, there you go. There you go. So, but it makes the skin so hard that you start, it's not feeling soft anymore. I, I always pray to the Lord and say, Lord, I want to I wanna confess to you every single day if I have to, so that the skin of my soul stays soft. Otherwise, have, you, you can have a hardened conscience. Do you know that? You can have a hardened conscience where things happen in, and, and it just it goes off a duck's back. Don't be like that. Come to the cross. Come to guilt. And say, guilt, I'm going to go to the cross. Get off that sofa. That belongs to the Holy Spirit and to me. We need to live this life. These are the effects. Now let's finish this morning on how to deal with guilt. How do we deal with guilt? A guilty conscience. First of all, there is only one way that you can get rid of guilt in your life. And that's to confess. Amen? You confess your sin. You say you confess all known and previous unconfessed sin. 1 John chapter 1 verse 9, he says, If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know what happens with me? Sometimes I find myself, and like I said before, a thought comes up of something that I did, maybe when I was 25 years old, I don't know. And all of a sudden I feel so ashamed again. This is the enemy, this is the accuser. 
He's standing outside and he says, you remember? And you know what, what I've learned? The moment it comes up in my mind, I say, praise the Lord. Why? Because I'm now reminded of what happened. And what is the easiest thing I do? I confess. I say, Lord, why did this come up again? Because brothers and sisters, remember, you will always remember the things you've done. Sometime your mind will bring it up. And when you get that feeling that comes upon you, that you've done something wrong, and, and the devil is there, remember what he wants to do. He wants to hold you back. And when that comes over, I go to the cross straight away. I make a beeline to the cross when these thoughts come up. And I say, Lord, this thought came up right now. I know it was wrong. I've already confessed about it, but why is it coming up? Lord, I just want to make double sure. Help me, Lord. I confess it again. Can you, can you confess too much? No. no. So, the first thing you do is you come to the Lord. When these things come on, and look, listen to me, when you do something, when you sin, the Bible says we've got an intercessor who intercedes for us, and he sits at the right hand of God. The right hand of God is the wonderful place. It's the authority hand of God. He talks about the right hand, and that is so wonderful. The second thing you do is you ask the Lord to reveal sins in your life. You ask the Lord to reveal them. And, and be careful when you pray this prayer. Be ready. Be ready, yes? When you pray this prayer, be ready that He is going to show it to you and it might put you in uncomfortable positions and thoughts. When you start praying this, listen to Psalm 139, verse 39. He says, Search me, O God. David cries out. He says, Know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there is any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Search me, O God. Search me. You know, I pray that prayer. Often I pray it. I say, Lord, is there maybe something I don't see? We need to live so close to God. Our account with God needs to be settled every single day. Every single day. You say, but wait a minute. When I get born again, the Lord wash away my sin, which I did in the past, present, and future. Yes, I preach that. Even your sin that you're going to do in two weeks' time, God already knows about that. And He's already forgiven you for that. Now, He doesn't give you a license to go and sin. This is what Paul says. Does it mean we get more grace and we can sin now again more? No, 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 that's not it. But even when you do that, what happens? You come to the cross and you say, Lord, please forgive me. Let me take you to the upper room. Here comes the disciples. They're going to sit down at the last meal, the last supper. And they walk in. And what did Jesus do? He put on the garment of a servant. A servant. Isn't that right? So why did He do that? Because the custom of the day, they didn't have nice shoes like ours, you know, which is clothes and you've got socks on. They, they've got what the Fijians call Jesus uh, shoes. Isn't that right, Kara? Yeah, the Jesus sandals. Now, I've walked with Jesus sandals in Fiji not so long ago, and there's dust there, and what happens when you walk with those sandals? Your feet get dirty, yeah? So it was just the custom of the day. When you walk into these houses, they had these water pots there. Why was the water pots there? So as you go in as a guest, the servant will come, you will sit down, they will take water out of these pots, and they will wash your feet, because your feet are dirty. Now, Jesus does something fantastic here in the upper room. There's no servant there. There's the water pots there. The disciples come in. So, oh, you know, we are the disciples. And Jesus put on that garment and he started washing their feet. And what is Peter? You know, our, our, our apostle Peter, what does he say? He said, no, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. I should wash your feet. But he didn't get it. Did he? He didn't. And he said to him, if I don't wash your feet, you have nothing in me. And when the penny dropped for Peter, what did he say? He said, Lord, just wash my whole body then. Just, just do it. He get it. He get it. Oh, oh, wonderful. But Jesus answers him something back which is so profound. He said to him, you are already washed. It's only your feet. You know what I take out of that? We are already washed. If you've come to the cross and you are saved, you are saved. 
by the grace of God. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 12 and 13, he says that we've, we've trusted in the word of salvation and we are baptized into the body of Christ. And he puts his seal on that. You are saved. Your body is washed. But it's only your feet. Why? Because you use your feet when you walk through the world. I get in my car and I drive into the city and there's a billboard there of a semi-naked lady. I don't need to see that. I don't want to see that. But they plastered it so big in front of you that you do see that. That's dust on my feet. That is temptation lying and waiting there. It is, you see, temptation is not the sin. It is doing the sin. James chapter, you can go and read it in James. So now you look at these things and you, you walk into work and somebody blasphemes God. They use His name as a swear word. And you overhear that. You didn't want to hear that. And then somebody tells you a, a sick joke. And, or you do something. Or some, you're part of something. And you come home at night. And you've walked on the dusty roads of sin in the city. You haven't partaken. Now I'm not saying, you know, it's going to keep you. But what do you do? I like to come to Christ at night and say, Lord, wash my feet. Will you? And you know what he always says? I will wash your feet. I confess. And we ask the Lord to show and reveal sin in our lives. Because we want to get this festering of guilt out of your hearts. Thirdly, we seek to make restitution. This is one of the things that a lot of Christians don't want to do. And when we're going to talk about unforgiveness, this is one that will come in. Restitution. Where possible, you need to go and make right with somebody. Now, they may not want to make right with you. That's not your problem. Your problem is to make restitution. You know, I, and I can testify again, brothers and sisters, I was a young pastor and there was an older pastor in South Africa and I became part of a group and, and I said something which, which you know, it, I don't know whether it was true or not, but that stayed with me. I was in New Zealand. I think it was five or six years later and that came up to me and I said, Lord, but I've repented of this, of talking against that man. And you know what I had to do? I had to pick up the phone and call him and I did. I picked up the phone and I said, Pastor, you know back then, he says, I've, I've already forgotten. I said, yeah, but you've forgotten about it, but you know what happened? The enemy came and he dropped it again onto that sofa in my mind. And this is why I'm talking to you right now. I want you to forgive me. Restitution is where you go, where it is possible, and you go make right. Luke chapter 19 verse 8, Then Zacchaeus, we know that he was a tax collector, stood and he said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and I've taken anything from anyone by false accusation. I restore it fourfold. You've got to make right things if you've done something wrong. That's just a biblical principle. Otherwise, the guilt will keep on sitting with you. And then, and then what do we? We trust in the promise that God, that He will forgive our sin and He will remove the guilt. Do you trust Him in that? He will remove it. Romans chapter 8 verse 1. Therefore there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. When? When we're going to preach through the book of Romans, and we will, uh, God willing, I will talk to you about this part in this verse, this last part. But for now, he says there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Are you in Christ Jesus this morning? Are you? Can I see hands? Are you in Christ Jesus? There is no condemnation for you. You have to trust Him. You have to trust His Word. And then finally, brothers and sisters, you withstand the accusation from Satan in prayer. You have to withstand him in prayer. He goes, remember Job, <clears throat> when, when Satan went to and fro all over the world, and, and he had to be, appear before God. He said, where were you, Satan? And he said, I went to and fro all over the world to see who he can accuse. And then he, he said, have you, uh, God says it, not, not, not Satan. God says, have you beheld my servant Job? Have you seen Job? And what did Satan say? He says, yes, I saw him, but you protect him so much. You see, he wanted to accuse him. He's the accuser. Revelation chapter 12 verse 10, and I love this verse, it says, Then I heard a loud voice from uh, saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of your God and the power of His Christ have come. For the accuser of the brethren, who accused them before God day and night, has been cast down. Has been cast down. 
This is future. This is future. This is coming in the book of Revelation. These things are going to happen. So does it mean that you and I have to sit now until it happens and wait? No, you can do it today. Today you can pray and say, Lord, those accusations that the enemy brings to you, I want to bring to you the blood of Christ. Because the blood of Christ washed it away. The stain of guilt. Now, brothers and sisters, this is what we need to guard your hearts against. The guilt. If guilt sits in your heart and festers there, it will have those effects that I've went through. And most probably when I spoke to you this morning, you felt it may be so true. It is the Holy Spirit is working with you. We need to work on our salvation, like He said. Have we learned something today? That's where we're going to stop. Amen. And we're going to ask the Lord to help us not to have a guilty conscience. And if you do have a guilty conscience, only you will know, you and God. Only you and God. Because I told you, you're an open book to Him. And if you sit here today and anything here in the sermon has touched you, reach out to Him. Reach out to Him. I'm a new creation. I'm a brand new man. All things have passed away. I'm born again. More than a conqueror. That's who I am. I'm a new creation.